Hello, friends. Welcome to Bird Shit, the podcast that I make just twice every, whenever the hell I feel like it, I guess. So this format is supposed to be this format. I've made two of these. This is the second one. There is no format. (laughs) But originally I was thinking, you know, whenever something happened that was kind of time sensitive, I could make a, a video using this format relatively quickly and just get it out because I don't have to do any sort of complex editing. Well, the news right now is incredibly dark and depressing. And though it's very important that we talk about what's going on in Ukraine and we do everything that we can to help Ukraine, I just want to put out something that's that's really stupid and it just has entertainment value. There's There's no deeper message here, not that there ever is in my awful videos, but this is just going to be us talking about some revolvers and a couple of other things like that. Just just fun stuff. I think revolvers are really fun. I know some of y'all hate revolvers, but uh, for those of you who don't, maybe this will just be something enjoyable to have on when you're in the car on the way to work or, you know, if you really want to annoy your significant other, this would probably be a, a good way to do that by making them listen to, to this awful mess. But revolvers. I've been really enjoying revolvers lately. You've probably noticed that revolvers have been featured heavily on the channel. Why is that? Is is TGP done with black tactical plastic 9mm semi-automatic pistols? No, no, of course not. I, I still love that stuff. But, you know, I go through phases where I just, I enjoy revolvers more. I just, I do. There's There's something different, and I find that very appealing sometimes. So, what do I find more appealing about revolvers? Um... Well, I like the limitations. Sometimes limitations can be good. Sometimes a limitation can make us practice harder. You can use a limitation to find holes in your knowledge, and you can take that time to to fill in those holes. So I like that it's harder to master a revolver trigger. Not that I've mastered the trigger on really any gun, but you do have to put more time into a revolver. I find the calibers more interesting, generally. Um... For me, last year was mostly about 10 millimeter, and it posed a similar challenge. I was I was really bored of nine millimeter, and then 10 millimeter sort of stepped in to 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 fill that that nine millimeter shaped hole in my life, and it just ended up stretching that hole out and making it bigger. 10 millimeter is a a hefty round. Doesn't seem that much bigger, but then you try to get it in there, and it's uh, it does not want to go. Well, let me tell you what. So that was what I did to amuse myself last year. I still love 10 millimeter as well. 10 millimeter is my favorite uh, semi-automatic pistol cartridge. But uh, you know, something like a like a 38 special snubby is challenging, but also has some benefits that I find very appealing. I think they're more comfortable in a lot of ways. We're gonna we're gonna get into that in a little bit more detail. And then uh, a small 357 then is challenging in a different way and then a big 44 magnum is challenging in a different way there's just a lot to there's a lot to love there but let's talk about why i'm bored of tactical black uh, plastic nine millimeter pistols first well they've gotten so good they're just kind of all the same you know folks will ask me hey will you review this this new um black nine millimeter plastic pistol Or, or or worse this brown one so i'm not i'm not super into the whole fde thing and i'm like I, it's not any different. I'll, I'll go and shoot them and I'll think, well, you know, I've got another one at home that, that I like just as much as this that I like even more because it's the one that I've been, been using for years. So I have a hard time getting excited about something new and, and something will come along that I'll get really excited about or I'll shoot revolvers so much that I get bored of those and then I want to go back to these other things. But they're so good now, it's really hard for me to not feel like whichever one has the most market share and has the best holsters is is the best option um glock walther hk you know i'm I'm sure i'm forgetting some others it's just hard to beat one of those and then when something new comes out like walther with the pdp is the pdp really that much better than the ppq i've handled one at the gun store several times and I don't really notice any sort of significant difference. It's just, yeah, it's, you know, it's a Walther. It's got the Walther trigger. It's a slightly differently shaped Walther. 
And you know, there, there are some things about it I don't like as much. I, I kind of preferred the grip on the PPQ a little bit. I thought it was extremely pleasant. One of the, the best grips ever in the history of guns. So I just can't get excited about anything. You know, I always come back to those things. And, you know, I've got, I've got my needs met so many times over on that front that I always just think, oh, I just wish I was shooting the one that I'm more familiar with, that I've got a, a bazillion rounds through. You know, mostly I, uh, I always want to come back to, well, the Walther PPQ um, and a Glock that I like. That's, <laughs> that's kind of where it, that's kind of what I'm always drawn back to. I always just think, oh, well, you know, I'd be, I'd be having more fun right now if this was a PPQ or a, or a Glock. You know, metal 9mm tactical automatic pistols is a different thing. I feel like there, there are more different interesting things out there on that front stuff is still is still happening there there you know there will be new new cool awesome competition pistols from cz and there are new berettas and then there are all kinds of uh you know uh, random new 1911s coming out all the time from different companies and though i've had terrible luck with new 1911s it doesn't mean they aren't cool and i like them at the range even if i've i've had really bad reliability luck with them they're still super cool so there's all kinds of new you know new metal uh, nine millimeters coming out all the time that, that, that do cool stuff. But a lot of those are more expensive as well. But revolvers, there's still so much to explore. Even though I've been shooting revolvers for 20 years, that's what that's kind of what I got started on on the on the handgun end of things. There's still there's so much I haven't seen because I focused on semi-autos for so long. You know, all the time I'll think, oh, you know, I haven't I haven't tried that kind of revolver. I want to give that a shot. There's just a lot to get excited about there. And I find myself more excited about everything gun related when I'm deep into this kind of revolver thing. And you know, we do need to talk about revolver viability. That's one of the things that that comes up all the time. Are revolvers as viable as these black tactical 9mm semi-automatic pistols? Of course they aren't. Of course they're not. You know, a Glock 19 that holds 15 rounds versus like a Ruger SP-101 and 357 Magnum. You get a lot more bullets in the Glock, and that's very comforting. The Glock is easier to reload. You've got more bullets. You've got better sights in a lot of cases. And revolvers require more maintenance to be as reliable as people think they are. You know, you got that image in your head of like revolvers are the most reliable variety of pistol-y thing that I can have. They're very reliable, but they do require more maintenance. I think that revolvers are for people who are firearms enthusiasts. Somebody who's brand new to guns just really shouldn't go out and buy a revolver. They're often told to go out and buy a revolver, but they really should not. It, it, a lot more effort is required to do the revolver thing, and that's overlooked. So at this point, you know, 20 years in, it makes a ton of sense for me to jump on revolvers because I'm going to put the practice time in. I practice all the time. I do I do dry firing all the time. I really do, do dry firing. Uh, I can't even remember the last day that I didn't do some dry firing. So if you're going to put that time in and you've been doing this a long time, revolvers are a great road to go down, but they just don't make a lot of sense for for new folks. And they have so many drawbacks. Right now, you know, we're doing a podcasty thing. This is all off the top of my head. I have, you know, like a couple of bullet points in front of me just saying, hey, talk about revolvers now. But, you know, I'm probably missing some things, but there's a huge gap a huge performance gap between semi-autos and revolvers. We all know this. So I just don't want to give you the impression that I'm over here saying, no, you should switch to revolvers. They're better. They aren't. But I also want to say they don't suck either. And they can still be very effective. And there is still a place for them. So I do get frustrated with folks acting like revolvers, like you should just take it and throw it in the trash now because the, the SIG 365 is the only good gun on earth the only gun that matters me and trash can possum on the tgp discord have talked about this a bunch just you know how irritating it is this idea that unless you're into whatever the gun of the moment is everything else sucks and is just a, a worthless piece of shit come on that's that's just not true revolvers do have some some uses but again i think that 
those uses are only going to be apparent to folks who are firearms enthusiasts. And then still, there's usually an auto that does it as well or better in, in almost every case. So just keep that in mind. But uh, So what do I like about revolvers? Maybe a little bit more than autos other than the kind of personal stuff that we discussed earlier. Well, I think that revolvers are more comfortable. When you have a revolver stuffed in your pants, um, it's so round and nice and comfortable. There aren't as many just like like square pokey corners and things trying to gouge you. It's just very organic and curvy and, and liquidy. That's really, really nice. I like that. It also sort of isn't as like uh, obviously gun shaped when someone is looking at your pants. People aren't just like, oh, you have a gun shaped gun crammed in your pocket. You know, when I'm just like walking around the house and stuff too, you know, having a having a gun to just stick in your pocket is is really, really cool. And something like this Smith & Wesson Airweight, it is super, super light. Even a, even a pocket pistol, even some sort of like pocket sized autos are going to be heavier than that. So that's really cool. And I also like that sometimes you can get more power for the same size than you can out of a pocket pistol. Now, I'm a pocket pistol enthusiast. I think generally it's better to have something that you can fire quickly. But I'm just trying this. I just wanted to give it a shot. And that is, that's one of the criticisms of pocket pistols generally. But I just wanted to see what this was like. You know, it's it's kind of fun to experiment and see what else you can find. So I'll let you know what I think. The 357 Magnum is definitely more powerful than 32 ACP, but you're going to get more rounds on target faster with 32. So since I've enjoyed the 32 so much and that speed, I figured I would try the power for a while. Revolvers also offer... Uh, uh, what would you call it? A sort of comforting simplicity, I guess. Uh, for instance, on the Beretta Tomcat, you've got the safety, the double action, and the single action pull. And, you know, in the mag release and stuff. It, not that that's particularly complicated, but in much the same way that it's fun to just try something different, it's kind of cool that on this air weight, it, you know, it's got the shrouded hammer. You just Take it out of your pocket and it's it's ready to go. Trigger pull is always the same. So that's kind of fun. Again, I'm not saying that I prefer one over the other. I still think that I prefer pocket pistols overall over pocket revolvers. But this is one potential benefit that someone else might see. And so I think this is kind of kind of an interesting avenue to explore. But the biggest thing is really just comfort. These are more comfortable to me. Um, and I think a lot of other people agree. It can also be easier to get one of these out of your pocket. I've, I've seen folks comment on that in the past, and I've thought, hey, what the hell are they talking about? Is it, is it actually easier? Yeah, it, it, it generally is. It's something about the shape. Uh, small autos can be kind of squarish, and it's tough to get your, get your fingers around it and, and get it out. This is, this is easier. So that's, uh, that's also interesting. But we're really just talking about comfort. I always bring up as many of the details as I possibly can, even when I do a review. This is not a review, but I still like to point out all that stuff. But really, we're here for the comfort. And oh yeah, the cool factor. So these are stupid reasons to prefer something, right? You, so you're, you've switched to this one thing because you're bored and because it's slightly more comfortable? Well, yeah, it's just, it's just something else to try. It's what I do. I like to switch things up. And I really don't like this mindset that we get that if anything is not a P365 that has an optic and a light, you, it's worthless and you're dead. That's really irritating. And so a part of me always likes to be a contrarian, and this is my present way to be a contrarian within the gun community. I objectively know that what I'm doing is worse, but it's also really fun and makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. Revolvers always make me feel the warm and fuzzies, and I think that's really important. So let's talk about these uh, some specific revolvers here. These these specific ones. Let's talk about the uh, the Colt Agent, a lovely gun from the seventies that I've got. Let's talk about the Smith and Wesson Airweight, and let's talk about the Ruger SP one hundred one. Uh, let's talk about the Airweight first, because that's the one everybody knows. The old J frame. Who who doesn't love the J frame? Uh, it's super light. 
I think this one weighs, God, I'm going to get this wrong. I think it's about 14 ounces. So yeah, about the same as the, as the Tomcat. But the Airweight feels lighter because it's not quite as dense as the Beretta Tomcat. I still think that for my taste, the Tomcat is a better gun. I like 32 a lot, and uh, though the capacity isn't a ton more in the Tomcat, you know, eight, eight compared to five, that's, that's pretty cool. And the air weight, when it's well-maintained, is more reliable than the Tomcat. Tomcats require almost constant maintenance, and you have to choose the right ammo for the gun. Now, if you do that, it's extremely reliable. If you if you keep it lubed and you're only shooting the ammo that it likes, you're good to go. It's it's about as reliable as a pocket pistol can possibly be. But I keep this air weight well maintained, and there's really not a whole lot that can go wrong if you put the effort in there the same way that you would with the Tomcat. The difference is the air weight is not ammo sensitive. It just shoots whatever whatever you've got in there. I really, really like just about everything about the air weights. I like the grip size. It's fantastic. It's perfectly sized. The uh, the padded kind of rubber grips that a lot of them come with are, are nice and fluffy. I really enjoy those. Um, I like the shrouded hammer. I love the weight. I even kind of like the gutter sight. You know, gutter sights always suck, but this has a, a, a really nice tall front blade that's easy to keep track of, so that's really good. And the trigger. Folks talk about the J-frame triggers. They say that they're they're just the fucking worst. Mine's not the fucking worst at all. I, I enjoy it. it. So it's it's got some stacking where <laughs> you know it almost feels like a like a like a two stage revolver trigger, which you know a two stage double action trigger is not a fucking thing. But it, 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 hear me out. So you uh, you pull, and then you know two thirds of the way through the pull, you you reach this stacking point where a, a lot more effort is required. But then when you push through that stacking point, you've applied so much force there that you just move right on through the rest of the trigger pull. So it makes for a really quick revolver trigger pull. And when I do a review, we'll, we'll look at that extensively. But it makes it so that this thing is, is pretty quick to shoot. I really like it. I think the air weight is fantastic. But again, it comes back to what we were talking about earlier. It fills my, my heart with warm, fuzzy feelings. It's so aesthetically pleasing. It's cool, and it's really, really comfortable. I dig it. You know, these are kind of tough to reload, though, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying out some, some speed strip techniques courtesy of, uh, of uh, John, the Practical Tactical Minimalist. You should check out his channel. It's, it's fantastic. We sometimes do podcasts together on this channel, which I really, really enjoy. Uh, John's just, uh, just a, a fantastic uh, YouTube creator with a lot of uh, really cool opinions. So... Check them out, and uh, check out the air weight if you've never shot one. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Also, folks say that they are not fun to shoot, and I could definitely see why you'd, why you'd say that. You know, it's, these are snappy, but I've been shooting at snubby 38s for, for two decades. You, you get used to it, and relative to other uh, uh, 38 snub noses, the J-frame's fine. It's It's... In fact, I may find some things about it slightly more comfortable than some other options. Speaking of the Colt agent, the my Colt was made in I think seventy four, maybe. Um, I don't know. You, you Colt people, you all know every fucking thing there ever was to know about a Colt. And then when somebody starts talking about the details, you're like, oh, excuse me, that's a, a generation nine point five Colt that has this minute change that has no bearing on anything. You got that wrong. And so I hate all of your videos. So y'all just fucking just don't worry about it. I'm about to talk, talk about some cult stuff. It's probably going to be wrong. And the good news is you're going to be totally okay. You're going to recover from this difficult moment in your life. But I think it's a, a second generation. Probably wrong about that. But it's the one with the with the fatter grips. And uh, mine is not parkerized though. It's got the um, it's got the 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 blued finish. So uh, the the Colt Agent Special is an alloy frame like the Airway, but it's a six shot instead of a five. However, I like the Airway more. the uh, The grip on the Colt this is the factory grip. Of course, you can buy other grips that are going to be smaller, but it's just really big, and I don't find it handles recoil as well. Even though it fills my hand a lot better, uh, I don't know. The fluffy grip on the Smith just does a little bit better job of, of keeping the revolver from from beating up the web of my hand 
I don't like the gutter sight quite as much on the Colt. And believe it or not, I don't like the trigger as much. So the trigger is, is objectively smoother. It's super smooth. And this one does not have a shrouded hammer, so we can look at the single action, which is, is of course, amazing. Uh, Colt triggers are, are, are always really, really good. Top of the pile, to be sure. But because of some of those weirdnesses with the air weight frame, man, it's faster. It, it just is. I, I, shoot it, I shoot it a little bit faster, although my groups are a little bit nicer with the Colt. And because of the grip, again, the Colt feels snappier. So I love my Colt. I will never get rid of it. it it's really, really great. But I do, yeah, I just, I kind of like the air weight a little bit more. And then we have the SP-101. I think that the SP-101 is probably the most interesting thing here right now. So this is a three-inch model. It's a, it's a 357. And because, of the, because it's a three-inch model, you get some good 357 performance out of this thing. It's, it's, really, it's really solid. A lot of times out of a two-inch barrel, I'm like, ah, 357, you've got to deal with all that blast. It's, it's powerful, sure. It's way more powerful than 38 Special Plus P. The people who say that it's not, you are crazy. Of course it is. But you're getting a lot of blast and a lot of recoil without a ton of gain. There's not a lot of not a lot of benefit there, and God, if you think the 38 special snubbies uh, a suck to shoot, <laughs> oh, the snub 357s, it's, you're not ready for that shit. It's it's not super fun, you know. Though I still kind of enjoy it sometimes in a, a really masochistic sort of way. But this Ruger is heavy. It's it's larger. It's another five shot, but it's larger than the air weight, and it's it's very heavy with that three inch barrel. Uh, I, I like it. I like it a great deal. The uh, sights are better than the air weight. They're definitely the best of the gutter sights here. Um, I'm probably going to replace the front sight with uh, uh, with something, maybe a night sight or I don't know. I think XS makes a big dot. My, is my phone dinging right now? I think it is. Sorry about that. Uh, I also I, I like these squarish grips. They feel very comfortable and are still pretty small. They fill the hand better than the uh, better than the air weight, which means it you know it, it it's not as easy to just uh, just stash it in your pants like it is with the air weight. But you're getting you're getting a lot of power out of those three fifty sevens out of a three inch barrel. I think probably wrong about this too, but I want to say most three fifty sevens. I don't know. 150 to 250 feet per second slower than whatever it says on the box most of the time. So that's that's powerful. That's very potent. And 357 does not suck out of this gun. In fact, I actually enjoy shooting 357 out of this gun. I'm, I'm a Magnum Revolver fan. This shoots like a proper Magnum Revolver. It's really pleasant. I could shoot a lot of 357s out of this in a day and not hate myself later. It's killer. And then if you put 38 specials in it, it feels so fucking fast. It is, uh, it is like lightning. The trigger is not as good as either of the other two because it's a it's a Ruger trigger. It has all the Ruger trigger stuff that we always talk about in Ruger videos where, you know, the, the double action feels kind of weird and then there's like some take up <laughs> with the single action and, uh, and some creep. You know, Ruger triggers are totally adequate. They are fine, just good enough. And you learn to love them. I actually like Ruger triggers now. I actively look forward uh, to them, but objectively, they're just not quite on the same level as some of the other things out there, even a non-performance center smith. Ruger revolvers, though, are just my favorite revolvers. I hope that's, I hope that's coming through in the video. They're, they're my favorites. So, revolver viability, where do we land? It's mostly a comfort and aesthetics thing. That's that's really what it is. You know, I talked about some other things like you have access to calibers that you that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, I mean, what else is <laughs> what else is there? They're you know they're super cool. Um, I, I don't know. That's kind of it. They're cool. They can shoot bigger bullets sometimes. They don't have as many bullets in them, but they're really comfortable to me. Just you probably want an auto unless you're just a, a revolver freak like I am. You know, I still, even between the air weight and something else, uh, you know, something like the Tomcat. The Tomcat's probably what I should be sticking in my pocket. The Tomcat, by the way, is just a fantastic gun. Totally, totally underrated. Um, you know, in the same size class, the, uh, you know, something like the, the Glock 42. 
That's another great option. The Glock 43, those are those are better guns. The Glock 43X, the 365, but they aren't as cool. They're not even close to being as cool. I'm always going to look at the airway and go, oh, look at that. Look at how cool that is. I want to I handle that and take it to the range. All right, so we beat revolvers to death. We've, we've said everything that can be said right now off the cuff, and I'm just starting to talk in circles. So let's move on to some other things that, that are kind of interesting. Pistol optics. I've been using pistol optics often for, for two years now. I made the jump. After two decades of shooting irons, I've switched over to pistol optics. And you know what I'm about to say is even more interesting, I think, uh, because I've shot irons for so many years and because I started on revolvers. And, you know, I'd still like to also have a, uh, a sort of, quote, combat-sized 357 revolver with optics on it. I think that would be fantastic. Because again, revolvers right now are just fucking doing it for me. But um, you know, I've got some thoughts on optics after after two years, and I'm still trying to decide how much of this is me, how much of this is a problem with my knowledge, how much of this is a problem with how my brain works and the way I approach problems. Because those are all considerations whenever you, you're trying to think through something. You have to assume that you're the problem. Because usually you are. If everybody else is having an experience and you're having another experience, then you, know, you have to assume it's you. But you also have to kind of look at the market and say, well, uh, are these people actually doing what they say they're doing? Are they actually shooting as much as they tell you they are? Are they... Are they just kind of reading something on a forum or is one of their favorite trainers or YouTube personalities saying something and they're repeating it? Those are also things you have to take into account. But okay, so, so here's where I land on pistol optics. Um, they're better in every way uh, uh, for nearly everyone, but there are some small things I'm running into in particular that are kind of bugging me a little bit. So, uh, so let me tell you where I'm at with a pistol optic, I'm far more accurate at at any distance where I'm using the dot. I mean, just, just far more accurate. And I can shoot a pistol at much greater distances accurately. Uh, the sky's kind of the limit now. That is super, super cool. And it makes you feel really confident when you take a shot. You you know where it's going. You know what's going, you know what's going to happen with that, with that thing. You don't always get that with irons. Um, uh, especially when you're, when you're sort of in that phase for the first five years that you're shooting where you're like, oh, no, you know, I know what I'm doing, um, but my instincts aren't there yet. You, you know what I'm talking about. We all remember kind of that feeling. Well, optics sort of sort of remove that. Uh, then uh, optics are faster most of the time, like way faster. Like you can you can shoot so much quicker. Well, but that's most of the time then there are, there are some limitations some limitations there that are caused by the technology and also caused by, by how we use it. And, uh, and then optics reduce uh, uh, certain kinds of you know, eye fatigue, I feel like. I feel like I can, I can shoot longer at the range. And then I think for a lot of people, uh, having the ability to threat focus is so nice and makes such a huge difference. People feel more confident. Um, so yeah, so optics, um, they're better than irons in almost every way. So, so what the fuck am I running into? Well, I'm kind of butting up against the limits like of what, of what my brain can do with optics. And, and, you know, I know this is, this is a me problem. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a fucking idiot. You know, it, it's, I'm sure there is someone who has found a way around this, but there are some peculiar things that I do that are, that are kind of starting to limit me here. So there's uh there's a speed threshold that I hit. You know, I do a lot of I do a lot of uh, a lot of recoil control drills. That's really important to me. I shoot I also shoot with a with a compensator on a, a lot of the time, on, especially on a lot of the guns that I have I have uh, red dots on. But uh, at a certain point, you're you're shooting at a speed where the dot is sort of getting, you know, pushed higher and higher. It's not having time to drop back down uh, uh, exactly where you want it. It's not having time to drop back down in the window necessarily at all. 
but you're still getting good hits on target. You know, even at, even at, at, out to 15 yards or so, you're still when that's happening, you'd still be getting perfectly good hits, and that's that's shooting you know pretty damn fast. The but with the dot, you're losing the dot. It's it's outside of the window when you're firing that fast. Um, I don't see any way around that. It's just. It's just kind of what happens. So there's a there's a top limit until uh, we get bigger windows. And by the way, this is all happening with with the RMR. I think that with the what's what's Trijicon's other thing the uh, the uh, the SRO, this probably happens less. You can probably go faster. And the bigger the window, the the greater that speed threshold is. You can go faster and faster. So you know, I'm trying to figure out how to deal with that because that seems to be an RMR limitation. And it's not frustrating. I mean, you don't ever, you don't really need to to shoot that fast most of the time. I just like to do it because it's fun, and I'm I'm there to have fun. So, uh, I've been kind of wrestling with that, and I think I'm going to get an SRO just to try it out. And you know, somebody speculated that the uh, that the way the aimpoint acro works, it it may do that a little bit less. So what the hell? I'm going to give that thing a shot too because it, it, why not? Let's let's see if it's if they're any different than the uh, than the RMR. Okay, so. We've got the speed threshold. Then there is the way that I use guns at uh, at really close ranges. So uh, at, at super close ranges where I can't necessarily like get the gun all the way up perfectly in front of my face, uh, I kind of calculate where the bullet's going to go at these short distances using the location of the front sight. My eye just sort of in my peripheral vision kind of locates where that is and kind of uses it to go okay yeah you know the bullet's going to kind of hit generally in in this direction but with the optic I've got this big you know metal frame hanging over the top of the gun sort of in between my my uh, peripheral vision and the front sight and then there's the glass and it just kind of fucks around with the way my eye calculates that and and just makes it makes me feel like I'm just not quite as as secure at these super close ranges where I'm not really sort of traditionally aiming with the gun because the target is so close you, you just you don't have to you're gonna hit it and you know maybe I've answered my own concern there but it just kind of bugs me a little bit having that kind of kind of blocking the way so not only do I feel sort of less secure and confident but it also just makes it so that you know my hits just they just aren't as good. So having that thing, it just makes me feel sort of, you know, sort of disconnected from that technique. And then um, the third thing is sort of the the way I the way I do recoil. And uh, hope I didn't say the last thing. It's just the third thing. There's there's one more thing. Um, so the way the way I deal with recoil is uh, so first of all uh, depending on what's going on depending on a lot of factors the distance and the type of gun and some other things i, I will thread focus a lot even with irons because you're going to get you're going to get good hits and again your eye is sort of aware of you know what the front side is doing even though it's even though it's blurry and um and you know if you shoot enough just on muscle memory you're, you're kind of going to get get the bullet where it where it needs to go and shooting fast um in the middle of recoil i'm, I'm kind of tracking that front sight you know, uh, even if I'm not sort of directly focusing on it, I kind of know where the front sight is. And again, just like we were talking about before, that's kind of indicating to me, of course, where the where the bullet's going to go. And with the optic, you know, I can't calculate that in the same way. And that's not a problem per se, but again, it's kind of a speed cap. And now this occurs mostly at closer ranges when shooting fast. And I mean, you know, like like five to ten yards where you can shoot super super quick uh there the optic is um is is really getting in the way what i was talking about before with uh with the dot leaving the screen is more happening at uh shooting faster at at longer distances but at closer ranges you know you the front sight can kind of be all over the place and you're still getting good hits and i really like to be able to uh um, to pay attention to that and yeah, of course, you know, you can still see the front sight through the window, but it's not the same. Your eye doesn't latch on to say it to things uh, through the glass in the same way that it's going to uh, when it's just kind of out there. So I'm working on on kind of adapting to that, but it's not going so great. So there's a there's a speed cap there up close as well. And then uh, last of all, it's 
there's a lot more effort required to sort of get everything to line up with the optic to get the shot. Uh, because you can't just kind of freewheel it again. It all comes back to the you know the fucking front side for me. Because you can't just kind of go, oh, well, the front side's uh, pretty pretty close. That's going to work at this range. It's totally fine. You have to wait until you get everything lined up. There's a lot more you have to do to sort of get it to work the way that you want. And then you don't have access to the dot in super weird positions anyway, you know, around cover and things like that. And that, that kind of bugs me a little bit. So, you know, there, there's so much that more that can go wrong, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, oh, with the dot, getting everything to sort of to sort of come together to get the shot that you're looking for the way you're looking for it with the dot. So I am aware that this is a me problem. This is related to the peculiar way that I relate to pistols. But I just wanted to provide a, an, an alternative perspective here. You know, I've been shooting with dots for two years and I've been shooting with irons for 20 years. So without a doubt, there's some of the problem there. And the other thing is I'm, I'm using only RMRs. Well, no, I take that back. I have some kind of vortex thingy on the Janik. So, okay, I'm using mostly RMRs and, and one vortex doodad. The vortex thingy does have a bigger screen or a bigger, more, more glass, whatever. I'm just going to call it a screen. I like that more. It's the fucking screen. That's what it is. It's the, it's the screen. Um. You know, I think that's that's part of it. Part of it is a technological limitation. As the technology gets better, then a lot of these things are going to go away. So we're this is a, a 2022 issue in a way. Some of it's training, some of it's me, some of it's experience. But a lot of it, I really do think, is just that I do some strange shit uh, when I'm when I'm using a pistol. I, it's just the way it is. But but I also think that a lot of us do. And I don't know if if any of you have have encountered these these problems. So I think somebody just coming into pistols during the dot era is probably having a much easier time with this. You're just jumping in. You're learning all this fresh. So, you know, it's, it's all the same to you. You can, you can benefit from this new technology. And the rest of us are benefiting too, but I think that we're, we might find that we're butting up against some of the limitations of the technology in ways that, that other folks aren't. Because I just, I do feel like, you know, I'm hitting this point and I'm like, God, I just can't, I can't quite break through some of these problems because at distances, you know, at the range in perfect position, man, uh, the dot is, is vastly superior. Like it just, it slays the iron sights. But then whenever you add one of these other strange variables, I don't know, I start to, I start to have not a harder time, but I start to, to butt up against the, the limits of the technology. So let me know what you think and, and let me know what you think it is. I mean, you know, this being the internet, you're all going to be like, it's you, you fucking suck. And, and you're right. I mean, I, I, I do fucking suck. But there's a, uh, there's a long way to go for me personally in terms of, you know, my own, my own training. But I also think, you know, it's also some that the technology uh, could be a little bit better. But we could also say that for everything, couldn't we? Every piece of technology, you can look at it and say, well, that could be better. That's the nature of progress. It could be better, and eventually, you know what? It, it will be better. Next on my list of random topics, the FN-509 is underrated. I really like that gun, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get a lot of love. Um, in the past, I've said, ah, you know, it's, it's not one of my favorites, but I, I keep shooting them. I keep shooting the FN stuff, and I keep, I keep thinking, oh, that's really good. That's really pleasant. I really like it. That's the reaction I have every time. So, uh, the FN 509, it's, it's underrated. I, I really dig it. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe there'll be one on the channel eventually. You know, it's funny, uh, as bored as I am of, of, uh, uh, black or in this case uh usually brown i see a lot of brown 509s uh, uh tactical nine millimeter pistols as bored as i am of those you know any chance to sort of show that something is uh as underrated i i do i do enjoy doing that even if uh if i'm more into revolvers right now so the 509 no so what do i like about it what do i find what do i find pleasant about it well um they're made in south carolina which i i really like um i, I kind of like that super coarse grip texturing in the past i detested it i don't know if my tastes are changing or what but like we have when i hand what i go oh that's 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 kind of cool i kind of like the way that feels um 
I love their suppressor height sights on the 509 Tactical. Those are just fantastic. They're, they look cool, but they're also just big and beefy and, and, and they just draw your eye right to them. So I really like those. Those are, those are really, really cool. And, um, and I like that the tactical comes with those crazy 24 round magazines. I think it comes with, <laughs> with one regular and then, uh, and then two 24s. That's a bonkers decision that I, I really, really enjoy. So 509, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's underrated there. So, um, you know, while we're just yakking about stuff, a, uh, a few months ago, man, it was longer than that. Maybe it was like a year ago. I can't remember. I made a video where I was saying that, you know, it's better to have a couple of nice guns than just like a pile of cheap guns. Well, <laughs> surprise, surprise, this is the internet. A shocking number of people just did not understand what the fuck I was saying. It's like they were, they were hearing what they wanted to hear. Because, you know, I put a funny title on it because that's what I do. They were hearing, you're poor. If you can't afford a really expensive gun, then you're a piece of shit and should only have an expensive gun. No, that's that's not what I was saying at all. So let's let's clarify. It's sad that I have to do this, but you know what? Other people are fucking sad. So let's, uh, let's clarify that. What I was saying is that there are a lot of people, and we all know these people, who they'll have like, 10 PSA AR-15s. Like, they spent thousands and thousands, thousands of dollars on a pile of just shit, shit guns. And that's what they have. That's, and they don't, they don't shoot, they only shoot a couple of them, and they just kind of sit there, and then they've got, you know, a, a pile of really cheap pistols. Well, what if, instead of that, what if you spent less money and bought one or two nice things. Spent less money. Th- th- that's it's more advantageous for someone who has less money. I, there have been times in my life when I have been astoundingly broke, and and I was always a proponent of you know spending your money wisely and just getting getting the best thing that you could afford and just having that that one thing and just you know just be good with your be good as good with your money as you can be and you know. Uh, if, if you have one or two nice things or just the nicest things that, that you can afford, then you're going to have money for food and rent and spending wantonly. You know, anytime you, you get some money running down to being like, I got to go down to PSA and buy another super cheap AR-15 to add to the pile of the others. There, there are better uses of your money. So I'm saying spend less money, get a nicer thing. And then just just move on with your life. Don't just keep wantonly buying cheap guns. Spend your money on things that are actually going to going to help you. Um, so yeah, I'm not I'm not I'm not shitting on poor people because you know I'm I'm definitely not a, a fucking financially well off person myself. You know, uh, but I just I do think it's important to not to not wantonly spend money. Uh, our economic system is very fucked up. There is, there is a ton of inequality. And when we sort of feed into a certain system by uh, spending unwisely, we are only enhancing that inequality. We're not doing anything to, uh, anything to fix it. So that's what I'm trying to say there. Uh, spend less money get something better and have more of the things that you actually need. That's the, that's the message there. And also too, going hand in hand with that. I'm also not saying that you have to have the expensive thing. I'm just saying, you know, get the nicest thing that you can afford and just get what you need. You know, have your, have a defensive rifle, a defensive handgun, and try to get the best things that fit within your budget. There have been many years where all I could afford, the, the best rifle that I could possibly get would have been, you know, it would have been a uh, PSA AR-15. And the best pistol that I would have been able to get would have been like a, a Taurus G2. That is totally okay if that's what your budget looks like. 
that's the that's good stuff. If that's the best stuff that you can get, that's going to totally work. Don't even worry about it. I'm not saying that you're crap or that, um, you know, if you can't afford something better than that, that there's something wrong with you. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just talking to the people who, you know, have enough money to buy 10 PSA AR-15s and 10 Tauruses. Tauri? 10, uh, uh, 10 Tauri. Uh, at that point, you know, you had enough money to buy like a BCM and a Glock. And you would have had so much money left over to put towards other things. That's what I'm saying. So just, just, when you hear somebody saying something and it makes you mad, that's okay. It's okay to be mad. You know, being mad can be good. You're allowed to get mad. But make sure that you're mad about the right thing. Make sure that, because it just makes you sound like a fucking idiot. You know, when you, uh, when you're, when you're attacking a position that's a different position than the one that's actually being made, that just makes you seem, you know, like a fucking idiot. So don't do that. Oh, a quick humorous anecdote. So uh, I'm filming a video that is, you know, can you, can you live on only food and drink from the gun store for a day? Uh, spoiler. Um, I don't know if it's possible. Uh, so, you know, went to PSA to film myself buying you know, like beef jerky and, you know, various, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, Republican energy drinks and, um, you know, like first responder coffee, because I guess you have to have, you know, special coffee, uh, for the police. You know, I don't know. I like to be like all, you know, all fucking jazzed up before they do no knock warrants and, and, uh, and, uh, and shoot civilians. You gotta get real fucking amped up for that, I guess. So, uh, you know, people see me filming and this, this starts to, uh, this starts to draw a few people over. And this guy goes, guy goes, uh, what are you doing? Are you posing with that coffee? And I said, I said, no, I'm filming a, um, filming a YouTube video where I only eat and drink, uh, uh, food and stuff from the, from the gun store. And I realized what was coming out of my mouth, that this was just sometimes you don't realize how stupid an idea that you have is until you're explaining it to others, you know, then you go, oh, that's really like, that's one of the dumbest ideas I've ever had. Now here I am, I'm explaining it to these, to these people. And this guy looks at me and he goes, why? And I said, I I don't, I don't, I don't know. And then he goes, well, uh, okay. And he just kind of wanders away. And that's when I realized this is an absolutely terrible YouTube video idea, and here I am in the middle of a PSA explaining how dumb I am to a group of hostile strangers. I'm wearing, like, weird, you know, weird, like, skinny pants and, uh, you know, like, uh, like black boots. You know, I'm just, I'm generally just, just dressed like an asshole here in the PSA, and these, these people are all just looking at me like, did did this guy come from the fucking moon? And I ended up abandoning that idea. I'm probably still going to pick it up later, but I almost caused an incident at the PSA um, by trying to uh, to film myself purchasing food. So just know that I put myself in dangerous situations for you people, the five people that like this channel. Just know that. <laughs> and, and I also appreciated that this gentleman at the store who thought that this was just the weirdest thing that, you know, he didn't, he didn't insult me and say, you know, you're a fucking idiot, you know, get out of here, you weirdo. He was just perplexed. He just wanted to know why some jack off wearing weird pants was in the PSA filming himself buying beef jerky and first, first responder coffee. And you know what? That's, that's, now that I'm saying that too, you know, that's, that's actually fair. I, I, I can't really hate on that guy for that. That's, that's completely fair. So last of all, for this episode of, of bird shit, LPVOs, I am considering getting an LPVO, but I need some help choosing one. Um, you know, I, I want to get something that's not too expensive, but I also want to get something good to test because it's going to be the only one that I have. I've used many of them, um, but I've, I've never owned one. I don't think, have I? No, I don't think, I don't think I have. So I'm considering like a, you know, like a Vortex or a Razor or, or whatever, whatever those are called. But my heart wants a Trigicon AccuPoint. And specifically, I want the one that, the one to six that has the triangle on a stick reticle. You know the one I mean. If you don't, you can, you can look it up. But I'm a, I'm, I'm really into that thing. I really like the AccuPoints in general. I've got a, what is it? A five to 20 power maybe. 
um, on my Tika, and I use that as, as kind of my long range uh, <laughs> precision rifle scope. You can call anything that I do precision. Uh, I really, really like the AccuPoint. It's uh, it's it's pretty awesome. So I'm having to resist the urge to buy the triangle on a stick because you know the AccuPoints are older, and I'm sure there are better options. But it also doesn't take a battery. It's um, it's got fiber optic and then tritium, and I find that very, very appealing. Anything that uh, that I can get that doesn't have a battery, I like that. That's that's advantageous to me. So let me know what you think of the AccuPoint um, or the Razor, or if there's something else that I'm forgetting. Like I know uh, Collis uh, makes something that's kind of cool. Every time I, I every time I talk about that company, I don't know if I'm saying it uh, right, but I think of uh, of of Kless. The ancient Klingon hero, um, who is who is brought back to life via cloning in uh, in Star Trek: The Next Generation. Big big fan of KLS. If you don't know about KLS, you know you're you're fucking missing out. Let me tell you. If you don't know about TNG in general, you're you're fucking missing out. But um, also in the comments, what are you guys watching? Um, we usually talk about entertainment in in podcasts. Uh, huh. Let's talk. Let's talk about uh, about all the things we have coming up this year. Okay, so we've got uh, we've got House of the Dragon on HBO. Uh, if you haven't read uh, George R. R. Martin's Fire and Blood, it's 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 good. You know, I like the way George R. R. Martin writes, and I like that it's like a fake history book. That's really that's really cool. Um, I've got high hopes for that. Then we have the um, the uh, Middle Earth show on uh, Amazon. It's based on the Second Age. I'm slightly more concerned about that. I'm a, a big Tolkien fan. Not because I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, there are, there are black dwarves. I'm so mad. I can't deal with it. I'm actually really glad that they're focusing on diversity. I think that makes a lot of sense uh, for uh, for a Tolkien show. You know, there are a lot of people that are mad about that, but I've got, a, I've got a decent argument why I think that makes sense. That's not what concerns me. I'm concerned that they're trying to, you know, sort of compress the timeline so much. I just don't know how that's going to work exactly. It, it makes sense from a writing perspective, and I see why that would have been discussed in a writer's room. And you know what? If I was in that writer's room, I probably would have suggested the same thing. But I'm still allowed to be concerned about exactly how they're going to pull that off. That's a, that's a, a fair thing to, uh, to be worried about. So uh, we'll see. Also, you know, some of the art that I've seen from it, I, I, think, I think it could have been a little bit more distinct a little bit more Middle Earthy because I know they have the rights to the look of the uh, Peter Jackson films and I would have liked to see a little bit more visual continuity there. But again, we're just seeing previews. Maybe we'll see that visual continuity in the actual show. Then we're getting Kenobi on, what is it, May 20... I know it got moved back to... It's May 27th now. I think we're getting two episodes back to back. That's really exciting. Um, To me, the prequels... I don't like them so much as I just think they're funny. Like I love how funny they are and I rewatch them sometimes because they're just, they're hilarious. Like I love the original trilogy because those movies are great with the exception of Return of the Jedi. There are fucking bears in it. Little bears wearing, they're dressed like little, little leather daddies. But uh, uh, the prequels I like because they're humorous. They are, they're quite funny and, and I enjoy that. So, you know, and, and, and Ewan McGregor definitely makes that work. He makes it, he makes it funnier than it would be otherwise. So that's exciting. And then there are also, you know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Arl Knots, uh, the YouTube channel that recut the, uh, the, well, all the Star Wars movies to make them funny and add kind of new storylines. I'm curious to see what they're going to do with the Kenobi show. If you haven't checked out the Arl Knots, you're, you're really, really, really missing out. Obi-Wan, Ben, Larry, Kenobi. Yep, always out there in the universe looking for looking for midi chlorians. The Arl knots are fantastic. Um, then you know maybe we'll get more Bad Batch this summer. That would be nice. I really liked the first season of the Bad Batch. It was excellent. It took me a very very long time to get into the Star Wars cartoons. I just I couldn't couldn't get into them for a long time, and then all of a sudden the the Clone Wars just kind of clicked for me, and I was like, oh, you know I, I do I do like this. That, that show's got some real stinkers, but a lot of the episodes are, are very strong. I, I really, really, really dig them. Um, let's see, what else? What else we got What else we got going on? Uh, they'll eventually, you know, release the Ahsoka show, but that's going to take a while. Ahsoka's probably the best character in the, uh, in the Clone Wars. Really, really well written. Um, not, not crazy about Rosario Dawson's performance in The Mandalorian. I just, 
I just think it was a little too serious. Maybe I, I don't know, but it, it, I would have. I would have. Rosario Dawson is an amazing actor. I just would have would have wanted to see the you know the the performance be a little bit more fun. And uh, then there there are a lot of other Clone Wars characters that are awesome too. Um, you know who should who should maybe get their own get their own show. And yeah, I can't believe it. I can't believe I ended up liking the fucking Clone Wars. Like that's 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 crazy. I never thought I would like an animated Star Wars show. But you know the pandemic draws us towards uh, towards strange strange things. Um, Oh yeah, speaking of the Clone Wars, you know Hondo. We all love we all love Hondo. I'd like to see him in something live action. That would be fantastic. Um, I, you know, um, Hondo, uh, Ahsoka, um, and then uh, God, I can I can never remember the character's name. Um, Forrest Whitaker plays him in, in live action. Um, well, I guess he's dead. Saw Saw Guerrera. I guess that character's dead after Rogue One. I suppose. Um, a lot of the Disney live action Star Wars movies, even Rogue One, I just I'm not that familiar with them because I, I don't like them very much. I just just not just not a huge fan. Um, uh, Picard, I'm gonna start watching Picard soon. Um, I wanted to wait until all of them were out. I'm not sure why they just felt like the right thing to do. I know it's kind of been divisive, but I really liked the first season, so I think I'm gonna like the second. I'm just I'm a huge Star Trek fan. Um, Star Trek and and Uncharted are two things that I just have never been able to get enough of. No matter how old I get, I just can't get enough. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I uh, I like Star Trek Discovery uh, somewhat. It's not my favorite, but because it's Star Trek, I love it. I still I still uh, I happily consume it. And um, you know, do I wish that Star Trek did? more of these days yes of course i do and i'm not saying any of this like i give them a free pass that's not what i mean it's that star trek has always worked best when it had room to take risks and look at deep space nine it it can take a star trek show uh, a, a couple of seasons to sort of find its footing and so discovery i think what what do they have three seasons out sometimes it can take a star trek show that long just to figure out what the fuck it is and fans know this and we know that we have to kind of give a show room to grow into whatever it's going to be over those first couple of years so that's why even now though discovery is not my favorite thing it could turn into one of my favorite things so we i want to give it room room for the writers to take risks and uh the same thing goes for Picard. We're on the second season. And I know that, you know, this is probably going to be a shorter show with less seasons, but I want them to have room to do batshit crazy stuff. And so I have a feeling I'm going to enjoy Picard more than Discovery just because I like the characters uh, a little bit more. Mostly because I, I grew up with with Picard and friends. But uh, it just, it needs that space to develop. And, you know, Star Trek fans kind of kind of know that. I feel like I'm forgetting something big. Uh, the second season of The Witcher was really great. Uh, I love that. Hopefully, we get season three pretty soon. Man, I feel like I'm forgetting something big. Oh man, that's gonna drive me. That's gonna drive me crazy. Um, I'm sure we'll get season three of The Mandalorian eventually. Man, I was so resistant to watching The Mandalorian because the the Disney sequels turned me off so much. I I wrote Star Wars off. I fucking hated Star Wars after the the Disney sequel films. And, you know, the first season of The Mandalorian, I liked it. It was kind of boring. Kind of, I was like, yeah, it's fine. But then the second season, oh, it was it was really, really good. I have to say, it was it was stellar. And then the book of Boba Fett. This is going to be controversial. A lot of people didn't like it. It's one of my favorite pieces of Star Wars media ever. Uh, it was so well done. It took so many risks. It was so weird. So many strange things happened. It was fantastic and i've rewatched it a couple of times star wars has kind of always been about about you know taking some risks well i should say good star wars has been about taking risks and even the prequels you have to say george was willing to take a risk and i think that's one of the reasons why even if the movies are disasters it's still fun to go back and go oh shit look at how crazy that guy looks it's fun look at how crazy that fucking ship is that kind of thing that's really really enjoyable but man, I still feel like I'm missing a feel like I'm missing a show here. I feel like I'm missing something really, really important. Well, that just means I'll have to make bird shit episode three, which will be just an hour of me talking about a TV show. Oh, I know what I'm forgetting. Halo. That's what I'm forgetting. The Halo show. 
the Halo show. If you're a Halo fan, which you know I, I like Halo fine. The games are the games are fine. I'm not like you know I'm like like obsessed with it. It's it's pretty it's pretty cool, I guess. If you're a huge fan of the games, you're you, I don't know what you're gonna think of the show. It's kind of just Halo shaped, and you know even though I'm not you know I don't obsess over the video games, I like them enough to be like oh yeah I'm gonna watch the Halo show and. I remember thinking, this is not Halo. I don't know what the fuck this is, my friend, but this is not this is not Halo. But if I sort of separate the Halo from it in my in my brain, well, you know, it's actually kind of well constructed. The characters are good. The acting is 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 exceptional. The writing is kind of uh, it's it's you know it's okay. And then the special effects are are terrible. So it's kind of a mixed bag. But I think the writing. Uh, will get better. The special effects will get better if folks like it. And the acting and the characters are strong enough to carry it, in my opinion, for a while. And maybe like Star Trek, we need to we need to kind of let Paramount just take some time to develop that into into whatever they want it to be. So so be patient there and you know give it some time. But um, I have to pretend like it's not Halo. But when I do that, I go, oh well, you know there is potential here. But if you watch it as a Halo show, it is absolute fucking shit. Um, it is. It looks awful. Um, none of the characters are, are who you expect them to be. The plot is very strange. It's a terrible, terrible Halo show. But uh, it's you know for a, a cheap weekly sci-fi show, it's uh, it's solid. You know for something that would have been on the Sci-Fi Channel if you didn't know anything about the uh, the premise, you'd go, oh, this is I kind of like this. It's it's pulpy and and culty and 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 kind of fun. So that's uh, that's my honest assessment there. And oh, one last gun related thing, just because I like to throw some some shit in at the end, you know, just 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 why the hell not? Um, you know, something else has been interesting me interesting to me lately has has been shotguns. Uh, this this thing happened when I was a kid where I shot shotguns so much that I actually got tired of them. If you can believe it, I shot so much shotgun that I just, I'm, I was bored. I mean, all summer for a, a more than a few years, I just shot 12 gauge for months, you know, a couple of times a week. And, and at a certain point, you know, when ammo was that cheap, even then I'd be like, oh, more 12 gauge. Good God. So, um, you know, in my thirties, I just, just wasn't that into it, but I've been getting really, really into shotguns and, um, I've been shooting the, you know, the Beretta 1301, of course, is, is, is tremendously awesome. But, you know, there's some other things uh, laying around here that I've been enjoying. But I'm going to be on the hunt soon for either a side-by-side or an over-under. Um, I think I want a side-by-side, but I also think I would enjoy an over-under uh, for completely different reasons. So if you know of, of, of a good over-under or a good side-by-side that's reasonably priced. You know, I don't want to spend a ton. I'm not going to buy like some, you know, custom shotgun from a custom gun maker, but you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to buy something super cheap, you know, maybe a CZ or something like that. That could be, that could be really fun. Um, so yeah, I'm on the, I'm on the hunt for that. And, um, and something knife related, I have been using a knife made out of Teravantium, um, a knife by, uh, by Terrain, uh, a 365. I've been very impressed by Teravantium and I'm, I'm, I'm working on an episode about it. So I just wanted to note, um, that if you're looking for a work knife, Teravantium would be terrible for defense because of some qualities that it has that I'll discuss, uh, in the, uh, in the video proper. But if you're looking for a work knife, it keeps like a working edge for a really long time. I highly recommend it, but do not buy one of those for defense. But um, if you have used Teravantium, I'd like your opinion uh, uh, on sharpening it. If you have any any tips for for how you did that, uh, I'll let me know. Um, or if you know any way to sort of get it uh, get it razor sharp uh, without a ton of effort. Because even without doing that, it's still fantastic. It's it's an amazingly good uh, blade material. But I'm just curious to get some other some other opinions on on that stuff. All right, thank you so much for listening to the second episode of Bird Shit. I hope you have a wonderful evening, and I will talk to you soon. Good night.